will be introduced by Max Arian, editor of the Volle Amsterdammer. And um, Max Arian will introduce Jeroen Anier for about 10 minutes. Then Jeroen Anier will talk 40 minutes. We'll have an intermission of 15 minutes about. And then there will be an interview and question and answering. Those people who, are, who don't want to stand up, for example, after intermission to raise a question, you can also write the question on paper and give it to uh, Max Arian. And uh, the evening will end about 10 o'clock. And um, in intermission or after uh, the evening is over, Yehuda Nier will sign uh, the books uh, if you like. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In the spring of this year, 1,600 women and men gathered in a big hotel in New York, at Marriott Hotel. They were roly uh, from my age, something like 50, 51, to the age of Mr. Nier, uh, 60 years old. They were all Jewish and they were hidden during the Second World War in countries like Holland, Belgium, France, Hungary and Poland. They have been hidden and by that their life was saved. For many of them who came there in New York to this Congress, it was literally the first time that they spoke out about their experience during the war. This experience had been hidden in the same way as they had been hidden themselves during the war. They had been all hidden children in that time, but that does not mean that they shared the same experience. Some children, like famous Anne Frank here in Amsterdam, had been hidden with their families. They could not get into the open for years, but they kept and even deepened their own identity. Other of those children lived under a false identity, but they could have had a rather happy youth in a family, as a, as a child of the family in a little village and have a good time. If they had been very young when they were adopted, they hardly knew that there was anything abnormal in that situation. But all the children, of course, had to forget about their past keep silent about who they were and had to adopt a whole new identity, a different name, a strange religion, sometimes even a foreign language. At this conference, I attended at one morning a gathering where I had really nothing to do, but I became very interested with the stories I heard of the Polish children. And they came together and they had a very harsh discussion. Um, they. Um, it was such a tense atmosphere and, and excited. They were, I, I, I don't understand Polish at all, but I could understand what they were talking about. Some of them said they wanted to talk about the long-rooted anti-Semitism of the Poles. And this anti-Semitism is really indeed still existing until this very day, although there are any, hardly, hardly any Jews in Poland where they can address this anti-Semitism too. Others, other of those children, I call them children because they, they call themselves mostly children themselves. They were saved by Polish families, mostly as very, very young babies, and mostly they were girls. And they said that it is better to honor those rather exceptional Polish people that did not make a difference between Poles and Jews, but risked their lives to save the life of a little child. Although in New York we heard many stories of children that were hidden during the war, no, none of the stories were as moving and dramatic as, and amazing and bizarre as those of the children that survived in the countries of Eastern Europe, and especially in Poland. There, the Jews had not only to cope with the Germans that were planning a systematic genocide of the Jews, but also with those Polish anti-Semitism. Uh, many years after the war, it turned out, children that were then grown up would hear from their parents 
that they weren't their real children, but that they had been adopted during the war as Jewish babies, and they had never told them. Um, those children can have been grown up in an anti-Semitic world without even knowing that they were Jews themselves. The story Mr. Yehuda Nier tells in his book is very different again of all those experiences that children that are, were saved by other people. The book is, I have been looking for a word to describe it, to describe lost childhood in Dutch verloren kinderjaren. One can say it's impressing, fascinating, dramatic and moving. It is really all that, but it is still more. It is as unbelievable and frightening as only real life seems to be. It is the story of a boy that was nine years old when the war started in Poland in 39. He grew to a very, very, he grew to a very, very early manhood in the coming six years. He and his family, especially his sister and his mother, passed through the Soviet occupation of their part of Poland. The terrible time when the Germans were yet coming, but not in charge yet, and the Ukrainians more or less spontaneously tried to kill as many Jews as possible, including the father of this young boy and many other relatives. Then there is this terrible trip through hell to escape the German killing machine, taking a Polish and Roman Catholic identity, fighting even in 1944 with the Polish resistance during the Warsaw Uprising. And then at the end of the war, finding themselves, the three of them, in a rather very strange, strange, lux luxurious situation as servants of a shockingly rich German family near Berlin. This story is told in a rather sober way. Mr. Nier is quoted as saying, I provide for the facts, you provide for the tears, you as a reader. And so it is, I think, as you experience when you read the book. His story is a chronique of the facts as he, as a young boy, experienced them. This evening, we are very happy to welcome Mr. Judenier here in Amsterdam. He came to Holland, especially to give more than 2,000 copies of his book to every high school and college in the Netherlands, so young people in Holland can read the book and learn about it. I was there uh, Wednesday in the Anne Frank house, and Mr. Nier was honored for this gesture, and we saw how moved he was to be there at that place where this other child that made this wonderful, did other wonderful book had lived, and a child that didn't survive like he did. Though Mr. Nier, tonight he will tell us about his book and about himself and his convictions. He will read from the lost childhood and we will be able to talk with him and ask any questions. I hope he will also tell about his life after the after the book and his story ends, uh, how he went to Israel, served as a soldier during the independence war, studied psychiatry and became a successful psychiatrist in the United States. And also, of course, how he set up on this task to tell this story in his beautiful book, The Lost Childhood. Want to come in? Maybe. See, there's some seats over there. So, I thank you very much for having me here. I feel very honored to be in this uh, place in Holland, and especially and in this John Adams Foundation, which kind of uh, addresses my American connection. I came to the United States uh, 30 years ago, and uh, somehow it became my home. So I'm not sure what the home is after my experiences. I've written this book in English and I found it very gratifying that very little changes were made, if any. I feel that this is a book that
Can you hear me? I feel that this is uh, a book that really uh, states the way things were, and I think it's very important. When I met with the Minister of Education the other day, after I donated the book, he said that this is an existential story of the war, and I thought it was very eloquently described. This is really a life in the war, rather than just another horror story about the terrible disasters or terrible atrocities that the Germans have perpetrated. And I think by trying to convey, and somehow, I don't know how, being successful in conveying the voice of a child, it's almost, despite, despite the fact that I've written the book about 10 years ago, which is like almost 35 years after the events, I managed to get in touch with all the feelings and the events that were there. And probably part of the reason being the fact that I was, as you will hear from my story, really totally alone in terms of uh, having friends or people to talk to except my mother and my sister. And somehow it almost was like in a deep freeze and suddenly an event that happened 10 years ago allowed me to, to let out all this information that I had stored. And amazingly uh, accurate, I was joking the other day with my publisher, uh, the Quadrat, uh, uh, about the Dutch contribution to my book namely when I was very lonely and 11 years old, 12 years old, and trying to figure out what sex is all about and nobody to talk to, I came across a book by Van der Velde, The Ideal Marriage. And I was really shocked, you know, that anyone can talk about sex. I thought I was the only one who had those kind of thoughts. And uh, what was uh, amusing, the book, I, a friend of mine found it in an antique bookshop in New York, and it was published in 1930, and somehow uh, I felt that this was like, again, some kind of, you know, ability to handle it. What happened, uh, as I was, you were told, uh, my father was murdered when I was 11 years old, within days after the German arrived in, in Poland. And w one of the things that, you know, is, as you will see in, in my book, I really uh, feel, you know, that how perversely organized and brilliant the Germans were. People say that Hitler was crazy. I think he was a genius because he knew exactly what works, who will respond to his ideas and how to organize the German people to elect him and then the rest of the world to support him. And the rest of the world, I mean really the whole world. There's a book uh, published by David Wyman, a professor at Harvard, called The Abandonment of the Jews, which deals with American reaction to the, what was happening in Europe in World War II. And Roosevelt, who was considered a very good man, a very good president, didn't do a thing to help the Jews to come to America, although they were ready to come and they were even willing to send them, but there was nobody. So Hitler really knew that he's finding a world where his situation will, where his approach will work. And so when they arrived in Lwów, in eastern Poland, in July of 1941, the Ukrainians were given permission to do anything they want, and they celebrated their long-kept feeling and murdered several thousand Jews, including my father. I, being 11 at the time, didn't really believe that this could have happened, and for the rest of the war, we kind of had this fantasy that uh, he maybe is working somewhere in some kind of labor camp or some coal mine. We didn't even know of labor camps' existence at this early time. My sister was six years older. She was 17 at the time and had this wonderful boyfriend, Ludwig Zelig, to whom the book is dedicated. He was murdered when he was 22 years old. And he was an artist, a writer at 21. He published a book on his own with his own photographs. And he also was very kind of inventive. He came up with this idea how to get, one thing was not to wait for something not to happen. It's obviously that they're going to get, get us. And so he suggested that we assume Christian identity. And he had this very clever idea. We, in Poland, you get the baptismal certificate from a church. And so we had neighbors, Catholic neighbors, and my mother surreptitiously asked them questions. Uh, what was your maiden name, Mrs. Govatska? Where were you born? What church? Like every day, one question. 
what uh, and so on and uh, what was your grandmother's name and then having all this information we wrote to the church saying that I'm Mrs. Głowacka I lost uh, my baptismal certificate could I get a copy and to our surprise two weeks later we, we got the original baptismal certificate and my mother became Mrs. Głowacka my sister did the same thing and the problem was with me at 11 I had to be somebody's child I couldn't be like another independent third my sister had a different name so like would be like three strangers together would be a little bit suspicious you see you always have to be aware what is about to happen and how to anticipate <coughs> potential question of people wondering who you are or how you are and so fortunately there was a black market for baptismal certificates in in Lvov in those days priests were selling blank certificates and you could fill in your name and Ludwig being a talented artist as he was he filled in my name and put the stamp around it and, and so on and so I became the little boy son of Mrs. Son of Mrs. Glowatska and we left Lvov for Krakow in order to not to be in a place you see this was Cynthia Ozik who is a very well-known American writer reviewed my book and she said you the story is the story what it means to be a human prey a human animal and I really only reading her review I realized that what she was saying was really what I experienced it was a mad chase and I was always said to be the animal and always knowing where the next danger is coming from and so the idea was that staying in Lvov we might meet former neighbors we might meet friends schoolmates of somebody and so on and they will immediately point us to to the police and we'll be in danger so we left Lvov moved to Krakow and then we were without money and we decided that it's very difficult to manage in Krakow and we had to move somewhere else the problem I was the main problem of this, what I call the triumvirate. You know, my mother, who was a wise woman at 35, she was an old person at the time. My sister at 18, who was smart, pretty, fast, sexy, and could kind of really be very clever, seductive, and so on. And I was the streetwise boy, the 11-year-old, who was watching everything what was going on and could report to the situation. So the triumvirate was working. The problem was with my looks. I didn't look very Aryan. And this was in Poland a very big problem. And so when I arrived in Krakow, we decided that I'm going to dye my hair blonde. And this was before Revlon. And and uh, you had to really, you know, uh, find this some kind of stuff to, to, you know, peroxide to do it. And they did it once and twice. And instead of blonde, I became red, red haired, which was worse in Poland. Only Jews are red haired. So. It was really kind of a, you know, again, a major, minor disaster. And, and Ludwig said, keep trying. And we kept trying, and I became eventually blonde. The next disaster happened three months or six months later when, again, those were the day before ponytails, and I needed a haircut. And how do you explain to the barber that you are here? You know, if I was, women tend to dye their hair, definitely boys those times those days didn't and so I went to the barber and said to him I something terrible happened I woke up this morning and my hair is half blonde and half dark I'm terribly embarrassed the kids are making fun of me on the street and again you know this kind of continuous on guard situation and could he could he help me and he said no he's never seen a situation like this condition it must be something very serious probably some kind of disease I should see a doctor first. And so I came up immediately with another statement. I said, you know, my mother is a widow of a Polish officer. You know, my father was a Polish officer, died on the front to make him feel sorry for me. I, we don't have any money, really penniless. Could you just do me a favor, cut my hair, and the moment we have money, I'll go to the doctor. And he did it. I don't know what was going through his mind, but this was the kind of, again, continuously being the human prey on guard, trying to outwit people who really were in danger. Another issue with me was the fact that in Poland only Jews are circumcised. And so while everybody, my mother, my sister, could act the Catholic ladies with me, they just needed to pull down my pants. And so I really had to work double on my image. It was very important for me to maintain this image. So I became like this very pious Catholic boy in front of every church. I would cross myself, say Hail Mary's loud in case people were 
suspe suspicious of something, they could easily detect that this wonderful pious boy couldn't be anybody, but just they wish their son would go like this. And so this kind of, I maintained this kind of identity. We arrived from Krakow to a small town in near Krakow, a resort, and this was winter, and how do you explain, it was very cheap, their hotels were almost for free, because nobody was going there. How do you explain why you're moving to a resort in the winter? And again, another story, my mother is a poor widow, Polish officer was her husband, she is uh, rheumatism, she needs a thermal bath, she cannot afford it in the summer, therefore we're moving in the winter. They moved also in such a way that only my sister and my mother moved in, I snuck in into the place at night, and so they didn't know that I existed. And I'll read to you the first part of my uh, of tonight's reading, describing what was happening in this place called Soshovice. My sister's name is Lala, and she's mentioned here. The winter of 1943 was long and painful. We had little heat. The windows were covered with frost early in December and stayed that way until March. I was cut off from the little contact I had with the outside world. Lala was the only one to go out, leaving for her job in the darkness of early morning hours and returning late at night. Often, she would bring scraps of food from her German employers and this would be our meal of the day. Although she worked hard, I envied her the freedom and the experiences, meager though they were. In order to save on coal, we would go to bed as soon as Lala got home and cover ourselves with all our blankets. My mother would read aloud the German newspapers Lala had stolen from her employer, analyzing the news from the Russian front. It seemed to us that the situation was starting to turn around. There was a flicker of hope. The Germans were caught in Stalingrad, and although it was difficult to get the true picture from the Nazi propaganda, we could read between the lines. The great victory march toward Moscow has been stopped. We understood that statements like, quote, the German army consolidated its defense lines meant that they had been forced to withdraw to previous defense position because of growing Russian pressure. It would take another two and a half years, 30 long months until we were liberated. But to us, the news meant freedom. We were ready to celebrate. I don't know whether we would have emotionally survived that long winter, but not for an unexpected development. Another family moved into the room on our floor, the Kowalskis, a young Polish couple with a two-year-old boy. Mr. Kowalski was a sickly but tall and handsome man, an engineer. He suffered from tuberculosis of the spine, and his doctor had recommended that he take thermal bath. His wife, Kasia, was very pretty, petite with beautiful blonde hair and dreamy blue eyes. She was outgoing and friendly. Before we knew it, she was spending days in our tiny room telling my mother all her problems. This was a welcome relief from the long, silent days, a break from an almost nightmarish existence. Kasia was a slightly more sophisticated version of Mrs. Novitska, our pregnant tenant in Lvov. She was surprised to find that I lived here, having been told by our landlord that the rooms on our floor were rented to two women. This was good news. It meant that downstairs they didn't know of my existence. Still, because of my circumcision, I continued to be the most vulnerable member of our trio. To improve of the Aryan image, Mother and Lala spent hours memorizing the catechism and all the Catholic prayers commonly used in church. It was important to know the prayers as the Gestapo used them as a test when they suspected someone of being Jewish. It was both painful and amusing to see my mother, the proud descendant of endless generations of rabbis, reciting Hail Marys and Pater Nosters. Sometimes Lala became angry at her for saying those prayers without sufficient conviction. Mother would burst out crying, saying she was giving up. I can't take it anymore, she would scream. By then, she was very depressed and unwilling to fight for survival. She had lost the confidence she had displayed immediately after my father's capture and was now merely following directions from Lala. I was sorry for her, but Lala, feeling the responsibility lay on her shoulders, was relentless. A few minutes after crying, my poor mother was again stumbling over Hail Marys, this time being coached by Lala to look at the picture of Christ hanging on the wall of our room and pray with determination. I was exempted from memorizing the prayers as all the Germans needed was to pull down my pants. There was no doubt in my mind that Lala was in charge now. Although her appearance was a little too dark in this purely Slavic environment, she was mobile, determined, efficient, and knowledgeable. 
I was envious of her freedom of movement and I had to struggle to comprehend what was going on. In those days of war and fighting, it was definitely a man's world. And to see my sister so active, so full of plans and ideas, while I was lying powerless on the bed, we all shared was an overwhelming experience. I was felt angry, humiliated, ashamed. In early February, I became very ill with severe stomach pains and a temperature close to 104 degrees for several days. We were alarmed, but we didn't know what to do. It was dangerous to call a doctor as he would immediately see that I was circumcised. Because of the high fever, I was hardly conscious, but I could see my mother and Lala crying helplessly in silence, knowing, I suppose, that I wouldn't survive without the doctor and that we wouldn't survive with him. We could not rely on the faint hope that he would not report us to the police. And what if he recommended hospitalization? On the fifth day of my illness, Lala came up with a brilliant idea. We would call a female doctor, and I, feigning modesty, wouldn't take off my underpants. At this point, I was almost delirious, but I forced myself to go over Lala's instruction on how to behave during the visit. No doctor was ever awaited with more ambivalence. I myself was amazed how well I acted with high fever. I screamed murder when she, suspecting appendicitis, wanted to examine the lower abdomen. I heard my mother, feigning embarrassment, explain to the doctor that I was getting my first pubic hair and was very self-conscious about it. Deterred by my persistence, the doctor simply prescribed some medicine. A few days later, I was well again. And this was just one of the many events that had to be handled in this kind of almost unbelievable fast way or this, you know, I compare myself at some points to a juggler, but the juggler where one mistake it, and the act is over, you cannot repeat it. After a few months in Swashovice, there was a, Mrs., our neighbor, Mrs. Kowalska, said that they are wondering what, how come my mother is still staying so long in this place. She doesn't need any more treatment, supposedly. And I don't know how she came up with the idea that they may be suspecting that we are Jews and they're going to check our identity. We left within a, a day and went from Krakow to Warsaw and arrived in Warsaw in April of 1943, the uprising of Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, I got a bed. In those days, you didn't rent apartments, you didn't rent rooms, you rented beds. And so I got a bed from a Polish landlady, Mrs. Krawczyk, who took me because Lala recommended me to her because she had a 12-year-old boy who was very poorly behaved, and I was described as this ideally behaved, calm, friendly, and so on. So it was like another assignment for me to now calm down and re-educate. Maybe to think about maybe this is why I became a psychiatrist. I never thought about it, but this connection. But this was like my mission. So like in addition to hiding of being a Jew, pretending that my sister, we lived in the same house, is not my sister because she had different papers. I used to call her always Miss Helena. I, and, and so on, I now had to be the model for this poorly behaved child. And in addition to everything else, this was, Ghetto Warsaw was burning, and the entertainment of the day was to go and watch the Yitz being burned. And this was what we did every afternoon with Mrs. Kravchik to go see. So you can imagine the upheaval of, of those days where I had to cope with everything. And again, it was a kind of another challenge. My mother, in the meantime, was lucky and got a job with this very wealthy German uh, businessman who had an office in Warsaw. He was transporting uh, weapons and supplies to the Russian front, and he had a major company to transport those things. And he, he his wife was in Germany, and he was in uh, Warsaw, and having great time, girlfriends, parties, and so on. And my mother became kind of the madame and everything together and so on. A lot of money to spend, which kind of helped us and supported us uh, this way. And uh, however, you know, there were like things always happening. And so Edek, the my friend who I was supposed to re-educate, started to want to re-educate re me and he thought that we should become altar boys. This was a new idea. The church was very prominent in those days, like you prayed every day, every night and so on. He decided that we would make wonderful altar boys, and so he 
got out his mother's at night, stole his mother's nightgowns, and during the day when the mother was away, we would put on the nightgowns, and he would rehearse with me, Ominus Vobiscum, you know, and I would answer and so on. And then we went for the audition to get the job, and I got it, he didn't. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think this is very significant because, again, my life depended on it. You know, for him it was just another thing that he could live with or without. It was just some, one of those, you know, crazy ideas, but I really had to do it. And, and this is a kind of another event. Fortunately, the priest didn't need anybody, so I didn't uh, have to go because it would have been a major disaster. Uh, what uh, followed was another very dramatic event. They started to wonder, you see again, religion being so important in those days, they started to wonder, uh, how come I don't have a, my Holy Communion picture? Everybody, despite the poverty, despite everything, this was like a very important part. And so I said, I left it with my grandparents in Krakow, and I'm waiting to get it. The mail was slow in those days and so on, but again, after three weeks, they started to ask. And again, my brilliant sister came up with this idea. She took my picture and went to a photographer with the following story. She said, this is her brother who died a week before his Holy Communion. My mother did not recover from this tragedy. And it's just her only dream is to have a picture of her son having gone through Holy Communion. This is the last event in his life. Could he make a photo montage? He was so moved that he did it for free. And, and I got the best picture, except for the halo, you know, I look like a saint, you know. It, it, it was really just, you know, one of those you know, the events. And uh, we continued this kind of endless, you know, as you will see in, in my book, this kind of continuously, the, the human prey attitude, always on guard. And things were getting really better. My mother, working for German, had the radio. The radio was not allowed uh, by Poles could not have a radio, and we used to hear BBC programs in Polish, and they were very good. Things were really moving, and again, you know how uh, careful one had to be. Uh, my her boss had a Polish employee who was working there and living there too. And one day, this was the holiday of Yom Kippur. Uh, they announced it, and my mother was obviously very moved. She, we didn't even think that, you know, about Jewish holidays and when they happened. And in order to cope with her tears, started to curse immediately, saying, oh, those dirty Jews, who, who needs, why should they be reminded even that they're holidays? And even the Polish guy was shocked how anti-Semitic she was. He said, you know, there are very few, why be nice to them, you know, that none of them is left anymore. But this was the kind of, again, ability to immediately respond. And I think we're really going so well in the uh, beginning of 44. The Russians were really moving very fast. The Western Front was moving in. And an event happened, you know, which was really probably the ultimate insanity of this whole uh, war experience. Namely, we celebrated my 14th birthday in Mr. Brockschmidt, the German man's. This was Easter time and Brockmead went to stay with his family, and my mother decided to have a party for me and to invite all our Jewish acquaintances that we knew existed in one way of hiding and to make a big festivity. And I'll read to you the description of that event. In March, we celebrated my birthday for the first time since 1939. It was probably the most absurd idea of the whole war. Brockmead was gone to spend the Eastern with his family, and he was in Germany. Mother decided to throw a big dinner party for all our Jewish friends and acquaintances hiding in Warsaw. I still find it hard to believe that it really happened. The audacity of the idea, a birthday party for a 14-year-old Jewish boy in the elegant and exclusive German section of the city, in the apartment of a German businessman and financed with his money, all this in Warsaw of 1944. Our guest list included 11 people, and adding the three of us, mother planned a dinner for 14. Because only Germans were, had access to telephones, Lala invited everyone personally. And uh, you will see from the list of the people that are coming to my party, the kind of situation that one had to be in Warsaw to survive. 
so not to arouse the suspicion of the concierge in Brocksmith's building, we gave everyone an exact arrival time, staggered their coming over a two hour period. The night before the party, I slept in Brocksmith's apartment in his luxurious bed, satin sheets and all. We were very excited about the extravagant plan and schemed until late that night. Mother dinners, mother's dinner menu underscored the meaning of the uniqueness of the event. Only Jewish ethnic food were to be served. Gefilte fish would be followed by chopped liver, chicken soup, and so on through the kichel for dessert, all financed by Herr Heinrich Brockschmidt. The first to arrive was Professor Zwilling, a well-known gynecologist from Lwów, my mother's doctor, whom she had met by chance on the street of Warsaw. Professor Zwilling was now living in a rented room he rarely left. He pretended for the sake of his Gentile landlady, who didn't know that he was Jewish, that he was writing a medical textbook and didn't have time to go out. Before he left Lwów, the professor had had plastic surgery on both his nose and his penis. I shuddered when he described how a Gentile colleague of his had devised a special procedure to reattach the foreskin to the glands of his penis in order to mask the circumcision. He was mockingly proud to be the first person in the world to undergo this kind of operation. He wanted to show me the spectacular results, but I declined. Just the thought of the operation evoked pain in my groin. Professor Swilling was suave and eloquent. He reminded me of Dr. Lando, my father's friend and a member of my father's war cabinet. Like Dr. Lando, he quoted Latin freely from Ovid to Tacitus and interspersed his comments with anecdotes from the time he had been a physician at the court of Emperor Franz Josef of Austria during World War I. It was only the third time I'd seen him and I'd been eagerly looking forward to his arrival. His presence brought back precious memories of the time my father was still with us. Tadjo Lala's admirer from high school days in Lvov, whom I used to see when I lived with Mrs. Kraftschick on Gibalski Street, came next. He looked peculiar, very Aryan with his bleached blonde hair, very tight pants and turtleneck with scarf knotted on the side. It was only after the war that Lala told me that Tadjo was living with a homosexual German civilian who had brought him from Lvov to Warsaw. The German had rented a room from Tadjo's parents in Lvov and the relationship must have started there. There were rumors that he had had the boy's parents killed by the Gestapo in order to maintain the homosexual liaison and have Tadja all to himself. Mrs. Schossler was next, with her old mother. She was the widow of a very prominent and wealthy banker from Wolf. Under normal circumstances, she would have not socialized with my mother since they were not nearly, we were not nearly wealthy enough for her. They knew each other from the PTA, the public school system uh, of my school, and met accidentally in my mother's neighborhood in Warsaw. Mrs. Schossler was also working as a domestic. I surmised from the way she and her mother were dressed when they arrived at our party that she must have escaped from Wolf with a lot of money. I looked in disbelief in her opulent black caracal fur adorned with a silver fox collar. Both women wore diamond necklaces of exceptional size and beauty. Wasn't she concerned about being seen by her employer? Mrs. Schossler had escaped the Anofsky detention camp in Lwów after having bribed a German guard with several large diamond bracelets. She claimed to have been worth more than half a million dollars. Her husband and her son were also released along with her, but the guard had shot them on the back after letting them leave the camp. Mrs. Schossler had managed to survive by falling to the ground after being shot and pretending to be dead until nightfall. Now she lived with her mother in a rented room. Her mother, who didn't know Polish very well and spoke mostly German and Yiddish, pretended to be deaf and dumb. She hadn't talked to anyone, not even her daughter, for two years. Zosia and Marisha were next. After the 15 minute interval, they were followed by the Kramers, now the Zapolskis, the only intact family we knew in Warsaw. They came with their six year old son, Jurek, now called Maria, as he was pretending to be a girl. We were all amazed how at six, he was capable of acting and behaving like a girl, which meant playing girls' games and urinating sitting down. In comparison to his achievement at six, mine at 13 seemed almost trivial. I hadn't seen him before, I had only heard about him from Lala. His father was a dental technician in Dr. Schmoll's office. I looked in disbelief at this pixish little girl with braided blonde hair and lively cheerful eyes. He was wearing a frilly white dress and red leotards. I didn't know how to behave, how to address him. Jurek, Maria, I chose to avoid him altogether. It was too much for me to cope with this. What a birthday party. 
There were two more people to complete the list, Kajik, Tadjo's friend, and his wife, Irpa. Kajik was different from all of us, and although we weren't enough that he was a Jew in hiding, he was a member of the resistance. Despite their all-out war with the Germans, the National <coughs> Resistance Army, the Armia Krajowa, accepted Jews into its ranks only with great resistance, reluctance. Most of the Poles weren't fighting Nazism, I think. They were fighting Germany in their ancient foe, and therefore remained comfortably anti-Semitic. The Jews in the underground therefore belonged to a splinter resistance group, the People's Army, the Armia Ludova, which represented the leftist and communist Poles and eagerly welcomed Jews into their myth. Many of the Polish guerrilla forces, so-called partisan, that were using the vast Polish forest in their headquarters and fighting grounds belonged to the People's Army. To many Poles, however, the Armia Krajowa neutral attitude toward Jews was unsatisfactory. They felt that hating Germans should not prevent them from hating the Jews. Of course, Kajik belonged to the People's Army. He had a fascinating but dangerous assignment. He was an engineer for the underground radio station that maintained contact between the Army headquarters and Moscow. The Germans had somewhat managed to track down the source of the radio waves and captured several of Kajik's predecessors together with precious <coughs> equipment. Kajik's arrival time was 2.45, but by 3.15 there was no signs of him and his wife, Irka. Professor Swilling tried to entertain us, but to no avail. No one was paying attention. The tension was unbearable. Mother and Lala were at the windows, looking out for Kajik and his wife, and some unusually, unusual occurrence on the street. Tadio recalls that Sunday morning, Kajik's station transmitted to Moscow. Maybe he is caught at this time. Typically, Marisha expressed what was on all our minds. Maybe the concierge, noting the unusual number of people arriving in Russian to absence, has reported this to the police, and Kajik, had been the first one apprehended. We would go now, we would be arrested now any minute. Hearing this, the Zapolsky got up and said they wanted to leave immediately. Mrs. Schostler's mother started to sob uncontrollably, clinging to her daughter like a little baby. Everyone was shouting at the top of their lungs. I looked at my mother who was pale and shaken. I knew she was blaming herself for having imperiled the life of all those people. I saw her go over to Professor Twilling and talk to him in an agitated voice. In the pandemonium around me, I couldn't understand what was she was saying. The professor was disagreeing with her, shaking his head vigorously. Mother was no longer paying attention. She went to the hallway and started to put on her coat. This silenced everyone. With her voice trembling and the tears rolling down her cheeks, she announced that all this was her fault. She would have to bear the consequence. She would go down to the concierge, and if the police were there, she would try to hold them off long enough for us to get through the service entrance and fire escape staircase. Don't try to stop me, she continued. Now calm and determined. I have to go. As she headed towards the door, the doorbell rang. We froze. There was no choice now but to open the door. It was too late. We'd missed our chance. Mother looked at us, hesitated for a second, then gathering all her courage, opened the door. It was Kajik. He was surprised to see us all standing in a frozen position facing the door. Our eyes filled with fear. After we come down, Lala explained to him what had happened. Kajik in turn gave his reason for being late. After the morning broadcast, he had gone to fetch Irka from the church. Irka, who looked very Jewish, spent the last year and a half hiding in the church. She would arrive early in the morning for the morning mass and stay there until it was dark and pretending to pray. We wondered whether she was still merely pretending after such a long time. From what she said, we deduced that she was starting to believe herself, to see herself as a Catholic. She had even said openly once that she had to thank Mary for saving her life. It was an ambiguous statement. We weren't sure whether she meant that by hiding in a church she were, had been saved or that she really was saved by a miracle. No one dared to ask for clarification. Kajik reported that Irka refused to come to our party. He spent an intervening time trying to convince her, but to no avail. Once more, it wasn't clear whether she was afraid to lose her cover or she felt that she had to be in a church because it was Palm Sunday. Our mood changed dramatically within seconds. Professor Swilling proposed a toast for foregoing his Latin, he said in Hebrew, Bishana Haba Birushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. He commented that this was a time of the year of Passover as the Jews in ancient Egypt, Egypt were freed from the slavery, we would survive Hitler and live to enjoy freedom and peace. Now everyone was crying, helping the vodka my mother had, was pouring into large glasses. 
Despite the ominous beginning, the party turned out to be an amazing success, everyone truly having a great time. I think it was partly due to the ability to recover rapidly, within minutes, from the most painful and traumatic experience, and partly due to the fact that all men were drunk. The highlight of the day was the news in Polish from the BBC London, which we all listened on Rockschmidt Radio. It was very good. The Allies were preparing an invasion in Europe. The war couldn't last much longer. Later in the day, Marisha provided another minor crisis, short-lived one this time, when she suddenly proclaimed that there were 13 of us in the house. 13 was an unlucky number, so Lala recounted Marisha was right. 14 would have been, would have been invited, but Irka's absence made it 13. The accountant found a responsive chord in Professor Zwilling. Very intoxicated by now, he had lost his initial optimism and instantly proclaimed the party was a Petronius feast, referring to the Roman bon vivant Nero's contemporary, who before committing suicide invited all his friends to a local feast. I resented this remark being made on my birthday. Fortunately, no one took it up and it was soon forgotten. What followed after this was another disappointment. The Poles decided that they don't want to have the Russian conquer Warsaw. They want to invite them to Warsaw. They will take it away first from the Germans and then have the Russians come in. Obviously, in those days, you couldn't outwit the Russians. And uh, we started an uprising in August of 1944. I was 14. I joined once more another entity. I joined the Polish underground army and uh, as a courier. And for two months, we fought the Germans. The Russians were standing across the Vistula, just a few miles away, but didn't do a thing. They wanted us to get destroyed. The London did not offer any help, although they promised initially. 200,000 Poles were killed in that uprising and we lost. And if this wasn't enough, they took all the people from Warsaw as slave laborers to Germany. And uh, I spent the last nine months of the war as a shepherd on Mr. Brockschmidt estate in near Berlin. We notified them once they got to Germany that we are there and he was very happy to see us and we were liberated there in May of 1945 by the <coughs> Russians. So this is kind of a summary of, of my book and there are obviously many other things that we could talk about and maybe we will address them after the break for coffee. Thank you. We have an intermission for 15 minutes. Uh, uh, if you want to uh, put your questions in writing, please give them here at the table and we'll see. Thank you very much. Second part of our evening. Um, uh, Mr. Nier, uh, at first, f f before asking you some questions and, and uh, reading some of the questions that came from the audience, I just want to add to your reading from your book, uh, for, for the people that didn't read the book, that you didn't even read the, the most exciting and, and amazing parts of it, that further on in the book, like you describe um, the situation during the, the uprising, the, 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 the trip you made uh, underneath, uh, through the mud, uh, the, what, what happened in Germany, it's even more Dantesque, like the Inferno, than the parts you, you read, and that were already so, so good to hear. Um, I, I, w I want to ask you, to begin, uh, you came here to Holland to give exactly 2,150 copies of your book to schools. I want to ask you, um, is it just because you think children should read your story, the facts, or is there a kind of message, or more or less hidden message be behind this gesture? You know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, can you hear me? As I mentioned earlier, I have uh, always responded to the reviewers of my book and really learned about the book and myself. And one of the reviewers, a professor of, uh, of uh, literature from University of 
uh, in Georgetown in Washington, described my book, he said, as a message from the edge of the abyss. A million children were murdered, and I'm one of the few to tell the story. And somehow the identity of a messenger rather than a writer appealed to me very much, and I decided not to keep any of the profits from the sale of the book, but just really to use them as the way of spreading the message. And so I see myself as a messenger. I find also the fact that the young people have responded to my book very well. They find it kind of, they can identify with the life of a boy during the war rather than the war itself. You know, it's like a very three-dimensional experience. Like people who read my book all immediately want to know uh, what happened to my sister, where's my mother, you know, all this kind of, it becomes very personal. I felt that this would be a good way of uh, telling the children that if one takes charge of one's life, you really can change things, both for yourself and for other people. And I think it's a very important feeling that I have that if I would not have taken charge of my life, have waited patiently for some miracle, I wouldn't be here to tell the story. And I think young people need it. They're full of energy, full of frustration, and they all sit and complain and are bitter and and don't know what to do. And I think if they know that if they can do it, they can do it both for themselves and for others. So therefore, it's kind of the, again, another wonderful thing is the Dutch connection. You know, my publisher, uh, Quadrat, was wonderful in this respect that he uh, did all the work for free. You know, uh, so I just paid the, for the basic expenses, which was a w wonderful collaboration. And again, you know, in my speech, when I met with the Minister of Education the other day, I felt that I really kind of somehow Holland is the right place to start with. There was some, there was always a very kind of way that the Jews were received here back 300 years ago, 400 years ago. You shake your head. <laughs> oh, they, they also were brought away, of course. You know why. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, maybe this is my optimism. Anyway, and so I, I thought that this would be a, a great experience. It has become a, a wonderful experience for me, even being here and having so many people respond to it and and seeing that really this is the right place to do the right thing. So then I think it's good to have a little bit more critical question that, uh, that we got from the audience. Um, you handed to, um, the book to Dutch secondary schools, a good gesture, I think. But, it is, but is the quotation in front of the book of Samuel Beckett not too cynical? Will they understand it, accept it? Perhaps it's good yeah. to, to... I remember it by heart. <laughs> uh, this is a, you know, a fabulous question because uh, the question because uh, the, uh, in, the quote is from uh, Samuel Beckett Malone dies. Uh, Beckett is my favorite playwright or writer, and uh, he says in Malone dies that let me say it before I go any further that I forgive nobody. I wish them an atrocious life and then the fire and ice of hell for the future generations to come. And this is the beginning of my book. When the Minister of Education received the book, which he was very pleased with and thought it was very well written, he said the only problem that he has is exactly the same question. How can he introduce the children to this kind of point of view? To which I answered by saying that another survivor told me that he is very angry at the Germans for taking away from him the ability to forgive. And that I feel the same way. That something that happened to me, the murder of my father, the murder of everybody that I was surrounded, took away from me the ability to forgive. And as painful as, as it is, this is how I feel. Also, I do owe it to those people who cannot talk not to forgive. And the minister was immediately on the spot in a wonderful answer. He said, I like your answer, he said, I'm, in my introduction to the high school children, I'm going to say to help them to face a world which one can forgive. And I think this is what I think, if we can accomplish a better world that one could forgive, I think then Beckett could be forgotten. I've wondered about a quotation, knowing some of Beckett, I, I don't know the book itself, I mean, he will put it in the mouth of a I, I guess, a very old, dirty man who hates the world. And then you have many levels in which you can perceive it. And there's a kind of, 
very bitter irony in it. Um, you take the quotation totally serious? Is, is, th is that true? When it comes to the people who hurt me, definitely. But in the book that are the Germans, the Ukrainians, the Poles, many of the Poles? Mm -hmm. Yep. And that also goes into the next generations, you think? The generations I have uh, problems with, and I was asked this question, how do you feel about the young Germans? And mm -hmm. obviously they cannot be accused of the crimes of their parents. However, I find it very troubling that the young Germans have not taken a stand. You know, there's the last generation that has a chance to point out a finger to their grandfathers or fathers and say, why did you do it? You know, and they, they haven't done it. So why they feel uncomfortable and very embarrassed more than anything <coughs> else, Germany has not really said mea culpa. And I think I'm hoping, maybe naively, and waiting for it. And the young generation is trapped. They're children of murderers. And it's a very painful position to be in. But they have not acted on it yet. But don't you think you're generalizing a little bit? I mean, it's not true for everybody there. Of course, no, of course, there will be always some people, you know, the people, uh, uh, Germans, young Germans who work on the kibbutzim in, in Israel and, mm -hmm. and so on, you know. This, but, you know, when we are talking about issues like this, the, you really kind of, you know, if there are three good Germans in Tel Aviv, you know, this is, doesn't make any difference, you know. There are 85 million left. And, uh, Pepper, or more? This is, how, you know, how, how I feel. You know, there was, there's a, a very famous uh, uh, survivor uh, of the ghetto, Warsaw, who lives still in Poland. He's the only one uh, person who's a leader, was a leader of the ghetto uprising. And about last year, he was invited to a German party, a reunification of Germany. And he wrote a letter which was published in the New York Times to the ambassador, German ambassador in Poland, which he said, sorry, I'm going to miss this party. And he says that in his life, and he's now 85, uh, he, he knows there were many Germans that were not supporting Hitler. Unfortunately, he never met one. It must be, a, it must be an accident. There were many Germans who didn't do this. Unfortunately, he never met one. It must be an accident. And please, Mr. Minister, forgive me, but I'm going to miss this party. And I think people who, have, who were there and who ex experienced, if there are some nice Germans, I'm sure there are, and so on, it really, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a major view of a ultimate, you know, somebody said once that the Germans will never forgive Jews the Holocaust. And the idea being that really the, the Jews evoke the beast in the Germans. And I really think that there's something to it. You know, it sounds very cynical comment again, you know, but there was something unbelievably brutal th what happened and how it happened. You know, I've seen bills that the IG Farben industry has sent to Auschwitz, you know, for the gas, they were paid every month. Auschwitz was paying the IG Farben industry for, for the gas. I mean, it's unbelievable the, the technique, <coughs> the technology of, of, of this thing, the organization the sacrifices that the Germans made in order to kill Jews, you know. They're affecting their supplies to the West, to the Russian front, because they needed the trains to go to Auschwitz. Still, I want to add a, a question that's put from the audience. I, it's in Dutch, I'll translate it. Um, for all, I am interested in the idea of not forgiving. It's also, like, it's also, um, um, said in the in the Foxconn interview and also tonight, um, I thought that this was really a rel relief to hear about you, you s um, talk about it that way, uh, saying that it's not n necessary, not needed that you would forgive. But for myself, I experienced this this not forgiving as a burden and a failure. Uh, can you say how you are living with this and what you think about this? It, 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 this is why, you know, when the man said, you know, I, I cannot, uh, uh, I'm angry at the Germans for, it, it really is a burden. And, you know, it was interesting, you know, in the article that the Handels... Handelsblatt, yes. Handelsblatt, yes. Yeah, Handelsblatt <laughs> had about me, you know, it, it's almost for me, it's, it's beyond rational, you know, it's a kind of a really a reflex reaction. And one of the things that I describe 
to the reporter was the fact that uh, when I read an article uh, two, month, two years ago about uh, uh, Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz, there was this book now telling the history of the company. And uh, the company was the first supporter of Hitler. They financed him from, since 1923. Their advertising was always matched with NSDAP, you know, always together. And even the visual imagery, the Hackenkreuz and the sign of, of Mercedes, there's some kind of unusual similarities, although it's not the same, and so on. And during the war, they employed people from concentration camp in their uh, factories, and then when they were sick or old, they would send them back to Auschwitz. And I found it, you know, again, very disturbing, and I Xeroxed, made a copy of the article, and whenever I saw a Mercedes on the street in New York, I put it behind there, windshield wiper. It's a kind of, and, and the article in, in this uh, newspaper really brings it as a headline, which I was really shocked. Yudanir uh, feels anger every time he sees a Mercedes-Benz. But this is a kind of almost like, again, the human prey aspect. They destroyed my ability to really take a distance. It's almost like a reflex reaction to feel that I've been hurt. And, and you know, it, it's, it's a burden. I agree with this person. It's a major burden. But again, what I handle it by taking action. You know, I do things to really, to, to remind myself and the world, including giving of this book of the injustice that happened, and I have a hope for a better world if one takes charge. But is it, is it, is the message, is it the best message one could give to these children, to these pupils, to say you should never forgive? I don't think I have the option to change my, my message. I wish I could. <laughs> I'm not saying it's the best. Maybe it's, it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a realistic message. And, and by the, uh, yeah, go ahead. Pressure that you should forgive. Why do you defend yourself? Why don't you say, why should I have to forgive? But this is a. Why should you forgive things like that? Can you. Maybe. <laughs> yes, it's true. No, no, to, to him, right? The question to him. <laughs> you, no, perhaps no, you can. But, uh, no, that's true. No, yeah. But it's more interesting to hear you. No. <laughs> Very good observation. I, I, it's, it's really a big topic, but I would next time I'm on the podium, I'll take you along because it sounds like you <laughs> you could defend me very well. <laughs> I really mean it. <laughs> it it's it's a too big. You know, it's really kind of we're going to, into really kind of philosophy of ethics and humanity, and uh, I'll be very happy. You know, to to spend time on it. It's. To be honest with you, but while people feel uncomfortable with Beckett in my quote, and by the way, I specifically used an Irish Protestant writer, not a Jew, because people say the Jews don't forgive, so I really wanted here totally neutral, <laughs> <laughs> neutral uh, Christian, you know, kind of somebody who really Christian. not uh, uh, think so. so uh, but, but you see, most people, when they look at this, uh, epigraphs in the beginning, and they smile, and I know this is a customer for my book. And it really, I've yet to find somebody really who would not agree with me, uh, except when there's like a major message, how can you expose our children to such a thing? I think one has to expose our children to reality, and not really um, necessarily to hatred, or to, but to a real assessment of the situation to allow them to face the world or anticipate or maybe prevent the next disaster which could happen. Um, I think we have more questions than we get to. On, unless it's on like the same topic? I would like you to consider giving this book to German households. Tomorrow, if they want it. You see, I have not yet found... Absolutely, this is my next trip. But unfortunately, the Germans have not published the book yet. They saw it twice at the Frankfurt Messe, and then they didn't uh, respond to it. And the Germans, again, forgive me, but have a tendency to buy books like this and not to publish them. 
because, you know, I know two books that were on that topic, because again, there's a kind of ambivalence, they're not sure there's an audience, you know, when the movie Shoah was first shown, only some uh, small publicly owned uh, TV station bought it, and then it became like a major thing, it's, all, it's awkwardness, but Germany is next, just find a pr publisher for me, and I'm there. Most children can read it in English, I guess, in, in Germany too. Yes, but, you know, it's not the best seller yet <laughs> in Germany. Um, I want to ask you something of a different kind. Um, you, tell, you, you have been telling us a little bit about this, this um, Van Velde, Het Volkomen Huwelijk, this book, but uh, I don't think it's the only way you, you were reviving your memory. Um, what happened with this memory? Uh, um, in this Congress in, in, in New York, most people had been silent about their experiences during the war, especially in the United States and Israel. Uh, what happened to you? And when did you come to write your book? It, it was really a very dramatic event that happened about 10 or 12 years ago. I was invited to a party in Connecticut. It was a very kind of elegant party. And, you know, I I'm very sensitive to accents, and I heard this guy, a heavy British accent, but I suspected there's something more to it. I speak five languages, and I have an accent in every single one of them. And so I said to him, uh, he introduced himself as coming from London, I said, it sounds like there was some other accent behind your British accent. He was a little bit taken aback, and he says, uh, yes, I'm from Poland. I said, where from Poland? He said, from Wolf. Oh, I said, I'm from Wolf too. Uh, where did you live? He says, on this street, oh, I lived around the corner. Which school did you go to? He said, to the same school that I did, uh, was a Polish Hebrew school. And uh, he said, what grade were you in? And he said, fourth grade. And I said, so was I. And then Emilia knew who he was. And he's uh, only, I think, with the only two survivors of the 600 children who went to this school. Last time I saw him was in 1939, fourth grade. And this kind of event really shook me up, you know, it was like a major upheaval of memories, of dreams. I started to dream every night and somehow, and was immediately almost like back in Lvov in 1939 where my book starts and, and this classroom and we had at that time already <coughs> a, a joint girlfriend, you know, at least we hoped she would become our girlfriend. She was a Viennese a girl, a Jewish Viennese girl who came to Poland in 1938 when Hitler came to Vienna. It was interesting, there's a woman in the audience here who asked me to sign a book and she said she also was in Lvov in 1938 as a nine-year-old girl coming. I was really shocked. I said, you are in my book. And it was, so the, all those memories came back and then I decided uh, to write. Interestingly enough, <coughs> it's difficult to find a publisher for a book about the Holocaust. Everybody says enough is enough, but then once they r read it, it, they feel it's different, it's not as overwhelming, it's more kind of a... But does this imply that for 35 years you have all also been more or less silent about your experience? I was more or less, I was, you know, but the, I think the world didn't want to hear and it wasn't ready to hear. I think the events were too painful to really allow uh, the world to deal with it. I think you needed the distance of whatever, 30 or 40 years, and somehow now, like, you know, the, even somebody was surprised that every day was an article about me in the Dutch newspapers, you know, it was like, you know, how come now? But there's some kind of feeling, and also I think the feeling that this group of people is fading away, and maybe we better catch up with, with, with before, you know, the, the witnesses. There's some kind of really stronger availability, and even my friends who knew me for many years suddenly, Wow, I didn't know that uh, you went through all this. But in your work as a psychiatrist, um, did you cope with these kind of problems or did it have nothing to do with your experience during the war? No, I, because of my uh, knowledge of the area and knowledge what feel people go through, I have continuously dealt with the survivors and the, and the really the, sto <coughs> the stories one hears are really just unbelievable if you really have the ear to listen to it. I recently saw a, a woman who was uh, two years old, she's from Antwerp, was two years old when the war broke out and she was in a convent for five years and when she was uh, seven her parents 
came back and took her back and they took her to the United States. When she was 12, according to the Jewish tradition, you have a bat mitzvah. And she felt suddenly extremely tormented, very guilty that she is betraying the nuns by going to a, having a bar, bat mitzvah. And so she would go on Saturday to have her bat mitzvah lessons and on Sunday to a church to confess. And she couldn't, didn't trust the priest enough to confess because he would think she's either crazy or something like this. So she would just tell him that she was a sinner and he would ask her, you know, to say some prayers and so on. She didn't trust the rabbi to tell what really was going on and would go, you know, back and forth and, you know, and so on. And now 30 years later, whatever, 35 years later, she's still the little girl somehow it like froze in this kind of dilemma, who is she? Is she Catholic? Is she Jewish? Is she not? Is she, did she have a bar mitzvah? She, whatever. It was just an unbelievable. And but those are kind of uh, events that one comes across. You know, stories that are unique, as unique as the Holocaust was. And I think this is a kind of. And unless one really tunes in, I'll tell you another story, another case, which was really probably even more dramatic. Uh, this was uh, a woman who was working as a seamstress in a factory in Brooklyn and uh, there was a fire in the factory and uh, she uh, developed asthma. It was no, she wasn't burned but was a smoke coming from the fabric that were burned, synthetic fabric. And she developed breathing difficulties and was hospitalized and uh, after this she wouldn't go back to work. And in New York they have a compensation board. If you have an accident happening on your job, you get paid for your absence when you're ill. She went to the compensation board, they said nothing wrong with you. She still refused to go and she went to a lawyer and he suggested maybe she should see a psychiatrist and she came to see me, accidentally he found me and I see this 55 year old Hungarian, heavy Hungarian accent again, accent and so on and I asked her like within two minutes, you know, where were you during the war? It was a Jewish woman. And she said, I was uh, in Auschwitz. And she then told me a story how she was, when she was 14 years old, they took her from Budapest to Auschwitz in 1944. And uh, there was masses, this was like the mass transit of, of Hungarian Jews into Auschwitz. And she was young and healthy, so Mengele selected her uh, to, to work. But there were thousands of them coming, and she was asked to sleep in this gigantic place which had a terrible smell. It was the first night and when she woke up in the morning she was told that they slept in a gas chamber. This was just for the night. Not to kill them but just for the night. And the fire uh, in her factory, the smell of those fabrics brought back memories of the gas chamber. You see so again you know again my interesting enough she was seen by another psychiatrist who, who missed it because he just didn't pursue this kind of thing and, and I went to the, there's a court that especially decides about those cases and I talk, I wanted to tell the judge what happened, I said please I heard the story once, I can't take it anymore, just sign your name, you know everybody was terribly apologetic that they missed it. But again, you know, my ability allows me to get this kind of information in a very short time. To connect to your, the first case that you uh, were mentioning, the yeah. woman that was confused about her identity or had yeah. perhaps something like a double identity. You yourself posed for not six years, but four years as a very pious uh, Roman Catholic Polish boy. And for you, you never had this confusion about what your identity was. It was always an act. I knew I was an, act, an actor. And as such a young boy, you can, you can make this distinction between what you are doing and what you're feeling? I, I could, you know, I think, you know, again, age, well, I was somehow the right age, although looking back, you, you see a nine-year-old, you wonder, what does he understand? But, but nine-year-olds <coughs> understand much more than we give them credit for. And uh, I think I, I could really distinguish. And uh, interesting enough, one of the uh, reporters uh, who read my book he commented about uh, my birthday party as the last supper and and I thought it was really kind of a wonderful comment you know because it's really 
had all the elements and there was 13 people and was financed by an outsider. <laughs> so was it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was this kind of, you know, it could have been the Last Supper because it was almost a suicidal idea to do it, you know. It could have been the end of what <coughs> it was both Easter and Pesach. And so it kind of really, you know, so I, I started again to reflect. Who was Jesus? <laughs> no answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I started to reflect, you know, that even when you question how did it affect me in any way those years, but there's some kind of, you know, collective unconscious with, you know, Jung is talking about. And there was something happening in those these days to create this kind of, you know, event. What was motivating us, I don't know. <coughs> I think it was a very wonderful comment. I, I liked it. I, I, I'm not sure if it wasn't also on my question. Because uh, what you do is you turn it around because you identify now this very Jewish meal with the Last Supper. Yeah, but the, right. I'm saying because there are some elements. I'm, I'm saying maybe, <coughs> maybe I, I wasn't in touch. In, you know, like while officially I was in touch with the Jewish aspect, and we're saying Shana Bab Yerushalayim, in deep down, maybe we were celebrating something else. <coughs> Are there any com I heard some <laughs> comments about it. I'd like to hear. Yes? You, were, you wanted? Uh, yes? Uh, you, you told something about your attitude to, to Germany, and also the fact that also the German generation has taken its responsibility. Um, what, what is your opinion uh, about the relationship between Israel and Germany at the moment? Uh, you have the feeling that. Uh, well, what's your personal idea about this? Uh, uh, I, I feel that the Germans are trying with great difficulty to be nice to the Jews, to the Israelis. However, the gas supplied to Saddam Hussein came from Germany. No, there's and also another side, because the Israeli state being accept all, all the help and all the... Oh, definitely. Oh, I, I, must, uh, this is, I think it's, it's a blessing to accept, uh, you know, even if you don't need the money, I think it's just, again, you know... You don't feel uh, revulsion? Mean, no, feel just the opposite. They don't pay enough, you know, I, I think. <laughs> they should pay as much as, as they can and, you know, give it out to charity, give it to... Tanzania. Because there are a lot of Mercedes Benz to this. <laughs> Uh, there are some. Uh, I fight them too in Israel <laughs> on my trips there. <laughs> but, but you know, not everybody is, is my you know point of view. But you know, but what I'm saying is that uh, the, my mother, who's 88, lives in Israel, and when she heard that the gas supplied to the Hussein during the Gulf War came from Germany, it was a very scary and painful experience, and they could have stopped it and they didn't. So it's a mixed kind of ambivalent attitude. They feel the world will not allow them not to give money to the Jews to Israel, but they're very, very reluctant contributors. I perhaps I should ask, uh, add a question. Yes, let me just... What you said about the Germans, could you compare them with the Christians as well? Because there have been not many Uh, I feel that as that the Germans have this ability to be bestial in this organized fashion, <coughs> being and I think this is why I, I always praise Hitler for his genius because he managed to combine the Herrenrasse, the Wagnerian id ideas, you know, the the Valhalla, you know, on one hand and Auschwitz on another hand, you know. So there was kind of, I think only the Germans were capable of really to be both the ultimate cultural people and the ultimate murderers. I think others respond if they have an opportunity, but I don't think anyone would have done what the Germans have done. This kind of systematic murder of tiny babies, you know. I don't think this, if people, the other people who, if they have any rage, they attack, they ex explode and it's over somehow. There's like a burst of rage. I think the Germans were different. Yes? 
I don't think I have an answer. <laughs> Perhaps every people has this. I mean, the Dutch murdered in Indonesia. Okay. Not like this. Well, no. Nobody. Rather a long time ago, I think. Maybe you don't have an answer for this. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I understand you never went back to Poland. Right. And could you say something about your feelings towards Poland and Poland? It's a kind of uh, confused feeling. I speak Polish and I read Polish literature and some I have some understanding and ties and then I have my memories of what happened and what happened even after the war. There were pogroms and attacks on the Jews after the war. So it's a kind of very painful way of dealing again with one's past. Like this is why this confusion, where do I belong, you know, because Obviously, I was for the first 15 years of my life in Poland, and I was in Israel, then in, 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 in the United States. It's a very kind of lost type of identity which I'm struggling with. And so I have uh, obviously very bitter memories of Poland, but uh, I have Polish friends in New York. And uh, it's a kind of very ambivalent relationship. May I add a question that was put in writing, and that's also about the Poles. Your character writes the Poles as being anti-Semitic. However, somehow you succeeded to survive between them. On the other hand, the, Ukraini, the Ukrainians, is that here? Ukrainians. Ukrainians murdered your father. How then was the nature of anti-Semitism in that Soviet Republic, and how did it compare uh, with anti-Semitism anti in the other republics and with the German or Austrian. So, so is there a difference between the anti-Semitism in the Ukraine, in Poland, and the anti-Semitism of the Germans? No, I was asked this question before, and my answer was that, you know, when it comes to anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, there are so many runners up for the first place that I can't <laughs> give them the <laughs> What do you think about what happens now in the Ukraine and especially in Lithuania? Nothing new. No news. All old stuff. Read, you know, the newspapers from 50 years ago, you find the same thing. It's nothing, unfortunately. No news. Would you call yourself Zionist? Zionist? Oh, definitely. Could you tell us what, what you were looking for in America? You, um, you, you didn't tell, but you went uh, just after the war from to Poland to Israel. Israel. And then uh, I went to med I managed to squeeze in another war. I arrived at, I was 18. <laughs> and uh, at 18, I was already in the Israeli army fighting the war of independence. And then I got my high school diploma at 21. I didn't have 
money to go to school, so I had to work during the day. And then I went to medical school, and I then went to the United States to specialize in psychiatry. And I really don't know exactly why I stayed. I always wanted to go, I still want to go to Israel 30 years later and probably never will. But uh, it's a kind of you know conflict, not knowing where I belong. And somehow, I think this my need to be on my own and to do it on my own as a way of surviving the loss of my father and so on always pushed me to places where I could like achieve something. And America was obviously <coughs> a better opportunity, although it made me feel very guilty that I abandoned Israel. And in 1973, the Yom Kippur War. I went back to Israel and rejoined the army again, and I was there for the time of the war. So it's a kind of really conflicted life, you know, that is not a result of another, and maybe another reason for not forgiving. You, you said um, just a moment ago that you have always been in charge um, for your own life, and to take to take charge for your own life, and in this period during the war, you did that in a rather individual way with your family and, right. and very close people. So that, that seems to, uh, like in the United States, the idea is that people should take charge for themselves. In Israel, it's slightly different, or it was slightly different. No, I think it's, it's an opportunity <coughs> to, for an orphan, as I experienced myself, to, to make it, you know. I think it probably I would have achieved something in Israel would have been much more difficult but so it was a kind of look again looking back is not what I decided to do then but I felt that like this would be probably a, a larger forum to prove my skills or something like this was a kind of not not really and because you know I'm very involved with you know in Israeli affairs and Jewish affairs and, and all this I'm very I'm on the Human Rights Committee of the American Psychiatric Association, so it's not really kind of a pursuing my own needs, but you know, pursuing a, an ability to again be in charge. Like arriving here this week, you know, this was again my decision to donate the money. My, you know, it's like this kind of search, I guess, maybe to rekindle those skills that kept me alive. You know, and I, I find, for example, that many survivors, when they age, and start to feel kind of physically incompetent or, or, or helpless, are, are very troubled by it because it's like for them another vulnerability feeling that if something happened to them now, if they were exposed now to a same experience, they wouldn't make it. And so many of them, for example, commit suicide feeling that this is the last chance to take charge of their lives. They're not waiting for death this time. They waited already once. And I think some of the, you know, writers, Primo Levi committed suicide after he was diagnosed as having a tumor of his prostate. And when he was brought to for surgery, he showed his surgeon his Auschwitz number, said, this is my disease, not what you're going to operate on. And then three months later, he committed suicide. Uh, Jerzy Koszynski also had a heart condition when he killed himself. So it's a kind of, you know, a really, an, I think, the attempt to prove that you still have what it takes to master the world, whatever it is at this point. You know, the challenge changes, but you don't. I think it's very important. Well, I'm very glad that, you, that you're putting it this way, because it was a little bit, you were a little bit portrayed like criticizing Primo Levi and criticizing Kuczynski, but that, so that was not at all what you Absolutely wanted I, to I do. Very much. Absolutely. I feel very strongly, you know, that there's some, something almost scary about, you know, those are people who are at the height of their success somehow suddenly realize that they don't have what it takes to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 yes. yes. Could it be that, um, uh, that they did not uh, emotionally survive? Exactly. Um, but would that take away some of our home? 
I think one should be aware of it, and once you are aware of it, I, I really don't think that this will, you know, deny, you know, I, I, I see myself, again, you know, like, and I, I, I'm not, like, you know, praising myself here, but I'm trying to deal with the issue. I think for me to give $12,000 to the Dutch children is a generous statement, so kind of my anger at the Germans did not take away my generosity, so it's a kind of a, a, a mixed you know, if we like trying to balance it, you know, as the, I don't do it just, you know, as a great Yehuda near, you know, giving the thing. It was really kind of a balance act being tuned in. But I, I really think that both Primo Levi was a dreamer. You know, he was a romantic. He thought that the world would be better after Auschwitz. He was interviewed by Philip Roth, and he said that he thought that uh, being in, uh, after Auschwitz, being liberated, is like Robinson Crusoe starting a new life. It was a fantasy. I think Koshinsky was truly destroyed by the war. He never lived a day without really reliving those trauma of the painted bird. Even though he was accused of fabricating, but you couldn't fabricate the painted bird because you had to have experienced it to be able to come up with those kind of experiences. So obviously he was destroyed from day one, never really made it. There was a movie that he made, uh, Being There, which I thought was a wonderful movie because I thought it was his autobiography. It really kind of the, the Chauncey Gardner being completely blank, you know, arriving in America, just the tabula rasa and all the experiencing projected on him, like he learns everything from the television from outside. And I think this is how empty Kuczynski felt and how he died. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, has your profession uh, being a psychiatrist uh, helped you to deal with your memories and maybe give you an advantage to other survivors of uh, the Holocaust? Possibly. You know, I, I, I'm not sure. You know, interesting enough, I was a uh, part of the training as a psychiatrist. Uh, if I'm a psychoanalyst, too, you have to be analyzed. Uh, yourself and I was in Anasa, no, like maybe 25 years ago, and the psychiatrist who was doing the analysis was so in awe of my experiences. You know, he himself felt so uh, overwhelmed and guilty and whatever. He, you know, that he like even didn't know how to deal with it. Only looking back, I realized so it was kind of. Uh, it, it's it's not clear to me what role does it play, but somehow, I, I feel that definitely offers me a lot of uh, understanding and also ability to help people in pain. I think we are going One to the question. end. Okay. You, you have a question? Can you say to what extent your ability to survive is tied to the human ability to survive? And to what extent is it tied to just born hardy and a survivor? I don't know what to tell you. I was born in this very kind of privileged uh, home, you know, I was, you know, I had a kinder Fräulein and a maid, you know, we were like this very, this was like the the Jewish dream of the 30s, you know, we were like moving into this upper class uh, rea existence in Poland, like everything was protected and so I, I, I'm not sure, unless there's some kind of genetic uh, loading here, you know, that I had genes that allowed me, so I, I really think it was the kind of, I guess, ability to perceive things as they were happening, some kind of, I think, a realistic view on of the world, you know, and, and kind of being able to observe and maybe respected by my parents for my observations. You know, I, I remember I was making poems about Hitler, nasty poems, when I was eight years old, and I remember my parents liked it and always told our relatives to listen to my poems, you know, so mm -hmm. like was giving some kind of, you know, credit already. The wunderkind, you know, is in the making, so. There's a difference between your story and many other stories, like Kosinski's uh, of survivors. People that survived often say that they just had luck. That's not in your case? No. I really don't think that it was, I mean, obviously some kind of luck, whatever it means, but it was always taking charge of the situation, always being on guard, always being alert, always outwitting, as I said, 80 million Germans who were after me. 
you um, you feel now being a writer, or was it just this one book that you had to write? My publisher feels that I'm a writer. I'm not sure he wants to publish my short stories, <laughs> so I hope he's right. He's over there, and I would like you to get up and just to me to thank you for for all you've done for this book and for me. Sure, he's a writer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.